Look out three vessels belonging to the Greeks, one a ship of Troidson, another a vagina, and the third from Athens. These vessels no sooner saw from a distance the barbarians approaching than they all hurriedly took to flight. The barbarians at once pursued, and the Troidzenian ship, which was commanded by Prexenus, fell into their hands. Hereupon the Persians took the handsomest of the men-at-arms and drew them to the prow of the vessel where they sacrificed him. For they thought the man a good omen to their cause, seeing that he was at once so beautiful, and likewise the first captive they had made. The man who was slain in this way was called Leo, and it may be that the name he bore helped him to his fate in some measure. The Aegean trireme under its captain, Asonides, gave the Persians no little trouble. One of the men-at-arms, Pythes, the son of Iskenos, distinguishing himself beyond all the others who fought on that day. After the ship was taken, this man continued to resist and didn't cease fighting till he fell, quite covered with wounds. The Persians, who served as men-at-arms in the squadron, finding that he wasn't dead but still breathed, and being very anxious to save his life since he had behaved so valiantly, dressed his wounds with myrrh and bound them up with bandages of cotton. Then, when they were returned to their own station, they displayed their prisoner admiringly to the whole host and behaved towards him with much kindness. But all the rest of the ship's crew they treated merely as slaves. Thus did the Persians succeed in taking two of the vessels. The third, a trireme commanded by Formus of Athens, took to flight and ran aground at the mouth of the river Peneus. The barbarians got possession of the bark, but not of the men, for the Athenians had no sooner run their vessel aground than they leapt out and made their way through Thessaly back to Athens. When the Greeks stationed at Artemisium learned what had happened by fire signals from Sciathus, so terrified were they that quitting their anchorage ground at Artemisium and leaving scouts to watch the foe on the highlands of Euboea, they removed to Chalcis, intending to guard the Euripus. Meantime, three of the ten vessels sent forward by the barbarians advanced as far as the sunken rock between Scythus and Magnesia, which is called the Ant, and there set up a stone pillar which they had brought with them for that purpose. After this, their course being now clear, the barbarians set sail with all their ships from Therma eleven days from the time that the king quitted the town. The rock which lay directly in their course had been made known to them by Pamon of Skyrus. A day's voyage without a stop brought them to Sepias in Magnesia and to the strip of coast which lies between the town of Castanaia and the promontory of Sepias. As far as this point then, and on land as far as Thermopylae, the armament of Xerxes had been free from mischance, and the numbers were still, according to my reckoning, of the following amount. First there was the ancient complement of the twelve hundred and seven vessels which came with the king from Asia, the contingents of the nations severally amounting, if we allow to each ship, a crew of two hundred men to two hundred and forty-one thousand four hundred. Each of these vessels had on board, besides native soldiers, thirty fighting men who were either Persians, Medes, or Sakans, which gives an account of 36,210. To these two numbers I shall further add the crews of the Pentecontas, which may be reckoned one with another at four score men each. Of such vessels there were, as I said before, three thousand, and the men on board them accordingly would be two hundred and forty thousand. This was the sea force brought by the king from Asia, and it amounted in all to 517,610 men. The number of the foot soldiers was 1,700,000, that of the horsemen 80,000, to which must be added the Arabs, who rode on camels, and the Libyans, who fought in chariots, whom I reckon at 20,000. The whole number, therefore, of the land and sea forces added together amounts to 2,317,610 men. Such was the force brought from Asia, without including the camp followers or taking any account of the provision ships and the men whom they had on board. 
To the amount thus reached, we have still to add the forces gathered in Europe, concerning which I can only speak from conjecture. The Greeks dwelling in Thrace and in the islands off the coast of Thrace furnished to the fleet 120 ships, the crews of which would amount to 24,000 men. Besides these, footmen were furnished by the Thracians, the Paeonians, the Eordians, the Botiaeans, by the Chalcidian tribes, by the Brygians, the Paeorians, the Macedonians, the Perabians, the Enianians, the Dolopians, the Magnesians, the Achaeans, and by all the dwellers upon the Thracian seaboard. And the forces of these nations amounted, I believe, to 300,000 men. These numbers, added to those of the force which came out of Asia, make the sum of the fighting men 2,641,610. Such then being the number of the fighting men, it's my belief that the attendants who followed the camp, together with the crews of the corn barks and of the other craft accompanying the army, made up an amount rather above than below that of the fighting men. However, I won't reckon them as either fewer or more, but take them at an equal number. We have therefore to add to the sum already reached an exactly equal amount. This will give 5,283,220 as the whole number of men brought by Xerxes, the son of Darius, as far as Sepius and Thermopylae. Such then was the amount of the entire host of Xerxes. As for the number of the women who ground the corn, and of the concubines, and the eunuchs, no one can give any sure account of it. Nor can the baggage horses and the other sumpter beasts, nor the Indian hounds which followed the army, be calculated by reason of their multitude. Hence I am not at all surprised that the water of the rivers was found too scant for the army in some instances, Rather, it's a marvel to me how the provisions didn't fail when the numbers were so great. For I find on calculation that if each man consumed no more than a coinix of corn a day, there must have been used daily by the army 110,340 medimni, and this without counting what was eaten by the women, the eunuchs, the sumter beasts, and the hounds. Among all this multitude of men, there wasn't one who, for beauty and stature, deserved more than Xerxes himself to wield so vast a power. The fleet then, as I said, on leaving Therma, sailed to the Magnesian territory and there occupied the strip of coast between the city of Casthenia and Cape Sepius. The ships of the first row were moored to the land, while the remainder swung at anchor further off. The beach extended but a very little way, so that they had to anchor off the shore, row upon row, eight deep. In this manner they passed the night. But at dawn of day, calm and stillness gave place to a raging sea, and a violent storm which fell upon them from a strong gale from the east, a wind which the people in those parts call Hellespontius. Such of them as perceived the wind rising, and were so moored as to allow of it, forestalled the tempest by dragging their ships up on the beach, and in this way saved both themselves and their vessels. But the ships which the storm caught out at sea were driven ashore, some of them near the place called Impni, the ovens at the foot of Pelion, others on the strand itself, others again about Cape Sepius while a portion were dashed to pieces near the cities of Meliboya and Casthenia. There was no resisting the tempest. It said that the Athenians had called upon Boreas to aid the Greeks on account of a fresh oracle which had reached to them, commanding them to seek help from their son-in-law. For Boreas, according to the tradition of the Greeks, took to wife a woman of Attica, that's to say Orithia, the daughter of Erechtheus, so the Athenians, as the tale goes, considering that this marriage made Boreas their son-in-law, and perceiving, while they lay with their ships at Calchis of Euboea, that the wind was rising, or it may be even before it freshened, offered sacrifice both to Boreas and likewise to Orithea, entreating them to come to their aid and to destroy the ships of the barbarians, as they did once before off Mount Athos. 
Whether it was owing to this that Boreas fell with violence on the barbarians at their anchorage, I can't say. But the Athenians declare that they had received aid from Boreas before, and that it was he who now caused all these disasters. They therefore, on their return home, built a temple to this god on the banks of the Ilissus. Such as put the loss of the Persian fleet in the storm at the lowest say that four hundred of their ships were destroyed, that a countless multitude of men were slain, and a vast treasure engulfed. Aminocles, the son of Cretines, a Magnesian who farmed land near Cape Sepius, found the wreck of these vessels a source of great gain to him. Many were the gold and silver drinking cups cast up long afterwards by the surf which he gathered while the treasure boxes, too, which had belonged to the Persians, and golden articles of all kinds and beyond count came into his possession. Aminocles grew to be a man of great wealth in this way, but in other respects things didn't go over well with him. He, too, like other men, had his own grief, the calamity of losing his offspring. As for the number of the provision craft and other merchant ships which perished, it was beyond count. Indeed, such was the loss that the commanders of the sea force, fearing lest in their shattered condition the Thessalians should venture on an attack, raised a lofty barricade about their station out of the wreck of the vessels cast ashore. The storm lasted three days. At length the Magians, by offering victims to the winds and charming them with the help of conjurers, while at the same time they sacrificed to Thetis and the Nereids, succeeded in laying the storm four days after it first began, or perhaps it ceased of itself. The reason of their offering sacrifice to Thetis was this. They were told by the Ionians that here was the place whence Peleus carried her off, and that the whole promontory was sacred to her and to her sister Nereids. So the storm lulled upon the fourth day. The scouts left by the Greeks about the highlands of Euboea hastened down from their stations on the day following that whereon the storm began, and acquainted their countrymen with all that had befallen the Persian fleet. These no sooner heard what had happened than straightway they returned thanks to Poseidon the Saviour, and poured libations in his honour, after which they hastened back with all speed to Artemisium, expecting to find a very few ships left to oppose them, and arriving there for the second time, took up their station on that strip of coast. Not from that day to the present have they ceased to address Poseidon by the name then given him of Saviour. The barbarians, when the wind lulled and the sea grew smooth, drew their ships down to the water and proceeded to coast along the mainland. Having then rounded the extreme point of Magnesia, they sailed straight into the bay that runs up to Bagasai. There's a place in this bay belonging to Magnesia where Hercules is said to have been put ashore to fetch water by Jason and his companions, who then deserted him and went on their way to Aya in Colchis on board the ship Argo in quest of the Golden Fleece. From the circumstance that they intended, after watering their vessel at this place, to quit the shore and launch forth into the deep, it received the name of Aphitai. Here then it was that the fleet of Xerxes came to an anchor. Fifteen ships which had lagged greatly behind the rest, happening to catch sight of the Greek fleet at Artemisium, mistook it for their own, and sailing down into the midst of it, fell into the hands of the enemy. The commander of this squadron was Sandokes, the son of Thamasius, governor of Chime in Iolis. He was of the number of the royal judges and had been crucified by Darius some time before on the charge of taking a bribe to determine a cause wrongly. But while he yet hung on the cross, Darius bethought him that the good deeds of Sandokes towards the king's house were more numerous than his evil deeds. And so, confessing that he had acted with more haste than wisdom, he ordered him to be taken down and set at large. Thus Sandokes escaped destruction at the hands of Darius, and was alive at this time, but he wasn't fated to come off so cheaply from his second peril, for as soon as the Greeks saw the ships making towards them, they guessed their mistake, 
and putting to sea, took them without difficulty. Adidolis, tyrant of Albanda in Cardia, was on board one of the ships and was made prisoner, as also was the Paphian general Penthilus, the son of Demonous, who was on board another. Now, this person had brought with him twelve ships from Paphos, and after losing eleven in the storm off Sepius, was taken in the remaining one as he sailed towards Artemisium. The Greeks, after questioning their prisoners as much as they wished concerning the forces of Xerxes, sent them away in chains to the Isthmus of Corinth. The sea force of the barbarians, with the exception of the fifteen ships commanded, as I said by Sandokes, came safe to Aphetai. Xerxes, meanwhile, with the land army, had proceeded through Thessaly and Achaea, and three days earlier had entered the territory of the Malians. In Thessaly he matched his own horses against the Thessalian, which he heard were the best in Greece, but the Greek courses were left far behind in the race. All the rivers in this region had water enough to supply his army, except only the Onoconus. But in Achaea, the largest of the streams, the Apidanus, barely held out. On his arrival at Aulus in Achaea, his guides, wishing to inform him of everything, told him the tale known to the dwellers in those parts concerning the temple of the Laphistian Zeus, how that Athamas, the son of Aeolus, took counsel with Eno and plotted the death of Phrixus, and how that afterwards the Achaeans, warned by an oracle, laid a forfeit upon his posterity, forbidding the eldest of the race ever to enter into the courthouse, which they call the people's house, and keeping watch themselves to see the law obeyed. If one comes within the doors, he can never go out again except to be sacrificed. Further, they told him how that many persons, when on the point of being slain, are seized with such fear that they flee away and take refuge in some other country, and that these, if they come back long afterwards and are found to be the persons who entered the courthouse, are led forth, covered with chaplets and in a grand procession, and are sacrificed. This forfeit is paid by the descendants of Kittisaurus, the son of Phrixus, because when the Achaeans, in obedience to an oracle, made Athamus, the son of Aeolus, their sin offering, and were about to slay him, Kittisaurus came from Aia in Colchis and rescued Athamus, by which deed he brought the anger of the god upon his own posterity. Xerxes, therefore, having heard this story when he reached the grove of a god, avoided it, and commanded his army to do the like. He also paid the same respect to the house and precinct of the descendants of Athamus. Such were the doings of Xerxes in Thessaly and in Achaea. From hence he passed on into Melis, along the shores of a bay in which there is an ebb and flow of the tide daily. By the side of this bay lies a piece of flat land, in one part broad, but in another very narrow indeed, around which runs a range of lofty hills impossible to climb, enclosing all Melis within them, and called the Trachinian Cliffs. The first city upon the bay, as you come from Achaea, is Antichira, near which the river Spercaius, flowing down from the country of the Enianians, empties itself into the sea. About twenty furlongs from this stream there's a second river called the Diarus, which is said to have appeared first to help Heracles when he was burning. Again, at the distance of twenty furlongs, there's a stream called the Melus, near which, within about five furlongs, stands the city of Trachis. At the point where this city is built, the plain between the hills and the sea is broader than at any other for it there measures 22,000 plethora. South of Trachis there's a cleft in the mountain range which shuts in the territory of Trachinia, and the river Asopus, issuing from this cleft, flows for a while along the foot of the hills. Further to the south, another river called the Phoenix, which has no great body of water, flows from the same hills and falls into the Asopus. Here is the narrowest place of all, for in this part there is only a causeway wide enough for a single carriage. From the river Phoenix to Thermopylae is a distance of fifteen furlongs, and in this space is situated the village called Anthela, 
which the river Asopus passes ere it reaches the sea. The space about Anthela is of some width and contains a temple of Amphictyonian Demeter, as well as the seats of the Amphictyonic deputies and a temple of Amphictyon himself. King Xerxes pitched his camp in the region of Melis called Trachinia, while on their side the Greeks occupied the straits. These straits the Greeks in general call Thermopylae, the hot gates, but the natives and those who dwell in the neighborhood call them Pili, the gates. Here then the two armies took their stand, the one master of all the region lying north of Trachis, the other of the country extending southward of that place to the verge of the continent. The Greeks who at this spot awaited the coming of Xerxes were the following. From Sparta, three hundred men-at-arms. From Arcadia, a thousand Tegeans and Mantineans, five hundred of each people. A hundred and twenty Orchomenians, from the Arcadian Orchomenus. And a thousand from other cities from Corinth, four hundred men. From Phlius, two hundred. And from Mycenae, eighty. Such was the number from the Peloponnese. There were also present from Boeotia, 700 Thespians and 400 Thebans. Besides these troops, the Locrians of Opus and the Phocians had obeyed the call of their countrymen and sent the former all the force they had, the latter a thousand men. For envoys had gone from the Greeks at Thermopylae among the Locrians and Phocians to call on them for assistance and to say they were themselves but the vanguard of the host, sent to precede the main body which might every day be expected to follow them. The sea was in good keeping, watched by the Athenians, the Aeginetans and the rest of the fleet. There was no cause why they should fear, for after all the invader was not a god but a man and there never had been and never would be a man who wasn't liable to misfortunes from the very day of his birth, and those misfortunes greater in proportion to his own greatness. The assailant, therefore, being only a mortal, must needs fall from his glory. Thus urged, the Locrians and the Phocians had come with their troops to Trachis. The various nations had each captains of their own under whom they served. But the one to whom all especially looked up, and who had the command of the entire force, was the Lacedaemonian Leonidas. Now Leonidas was the son of Anaxandridas, who was the son of Leo, who was the son of Eurycratidas, who was the son of Anaxander, who was the son of Eurycrates, who was the son of Polydorus, who was the son of Alcamenes, who was the son of Telecles, who was the son of Archelaus, who was the son of Agesilaus, who was the son of Dorissus, who was the son of Labotus, who was the son of Echestratus, who was the son of Agis, who was the son of Eurysthenes, who was the son of Aristodemus, who was the son of Aristomachus, who was the son of Cleodius, who was the son of Helus, who was the son of Hercules. Leonidas had come to be king of Sparta quite unexpectedly. Having two elder brothers, Cleomenes and Dorius, he had no thought of ever mounting the throne. However, when Cleomenes died without male offspring, as Dorius was likewise deceased, having perished in Sicily, the crown fell to Leonidas, who was older than Cleombritus, the youngest of the sons of Anaxandridas, and moreover was married to the daughter of Cleomenes. He had now come to Thermopylae, accompanied by the three hundred men which the law assigned him, whom he had himself chosen from among the citizens, and who were all of them fathers with sons living. On his way he had taken the troops from Thebes, whose number I have already mentioned, and who were under the command of Leontiades, the son of Eurymachus. The reason why he made a point of taking troops from Thebes, and Thebes only, was that the Thebans were strongly suspected of being well inclined to the Medes. Leonidas therefore called on them to come with him to the war, wishing to see whether they would comply with his demand or openly refuse and disclaim the Greek alliance. They, however, though their wishes lent the other way, nevertheless sent the men. The force with Leonidas was sent forward by the Spartans in advance of their main body, 
that the sight of them might encourage the Allies to fight and hinder them from going over to the Medes, as it was likely they might have done had they seen that Sparta was backward. They intended presently, when they'd celebrated the Carnion Festival, which was what now kept them at home, to leave a garrison in Sparta and hasten in full force to join the army. The rest of the Allies also intended to act similarly, for it happened that the Olympic Festival fell exactly at this same period. None of them looked to see the contest at Thermopylae decided so speedily, wherefore they were content to send forward a mere advanced guard. Such accordingly were the intentions of the Allies. The Greek forces at Thermopylae, when the Persian army drew near to the entrance of the pass, were seized with fear, and a council was held to consider about a retreat. It was the wish of the Peloponnesians generally that the army should fall back upon the Peloponnese and there guard the Isthmus. But Leonidas, who saw with what indignation the Phocians and Locrians heard of this plan, gave his voice for remaining where they were, while they sent envoys to the several cities to ask for help, since they were too few to make a stand against an army like that of the Medes. While this debate was going on, Xerxes sent a mounted spy to observe the Greeks and note how many they were and see what they were doing. He'd heard before he came out of Thessaly that a few men were assembled at this place and that at their head were certain Lacedaemonians under Leonidas, a descendant of Heracles. The horsemen rode up to the camp and looked about him but didn't see the whole army for such as were on the further side of the wall, which had been rebuilt and was now carefully guarded, it wasn't possible for him to behold, but he observed those on the outside who were encamped in front of the rampart. It chanced that at this time the Lacedaemonians held the outer guard and were seen by the spy, some of them engaged in gymnastic exercises, others combing their long hair. At this the spy greatly marvelled, but he counted their number, and when he had taken accurate note of everything, he rode back quietly, for no one pursued after him nor paid any heed to his visit. So he returned and told Xerxes all that he had seen. Upon this Xerxes, who had no means of surmising the truth, namely that the Spartans were preparing to do or die manfully, but thought it laughable that they should be engaged in such employments, sent and called to his presence Demaratus the son of Ariston, who still remained with the army. When he appeared, Xerxes told him all that he had heard, and questioned him concerning the news, since he was anxious to understand the meaning of such behavior on the part of the Spartans. Then Demaratus said, I spake to thee, O king, concerning these men long since, when we had but just begun our march upon Greece. Thou, however, didst only laugh at my words when I told thee of all this, which I saw would come to pass. Earnestly do I struggle at all times to speak truth to thee, sire, and now listen to it once more. These men have come to dispute the pass with us, and it is for this that they are now making ready. It is their custom, when they are about to hazard their lives, to adorn their heads with care. But be assured, however, that if thou canst subdue the men who are here, and the Lacedaemonians who remain in Sparta, there is no other nation in all the world which will venture to lift a hand in their defense. Thou hast now to deal with the first kingdom and town in Greece, and with the bravest men. Then Xerxes, to whom what Demaratus said seemed altogether to surpass belief, asked further how it was possible for so small an army to contend with his. O oh, king, Demaratus answered, let me be treated as a liar if matters fall not out as I say. But Xerxes was not persuaded any the more. Four whole days he suffered to go by, expecting that the Greeks would run away. When, however, he found on the fifth that they were not gone, thinking that their firm stand was mere impudence and recklessness, he grew wroth and sent against them the Medes and Kissians, with orders to take them alive and bring them into his presence. Then the Medes rushed forward and charged the Greeks, but fell in vast numbers. Others, however, took the places of the slain and would not be beaten off, though they suffered terrible losses. 
In this way it became clear to all, and especially to the king, that though he had plenty of competence, he had but very few warriors. The struggle, however, continued during the whole day. Then the Medes, having met so rough a reception, withdrew from the fight, and their place was taken by the band of Persians under Hidanes, whom the king called his immortals. They, it was thought, would soon finish the business. But when they joined battle with the Greeks, twas no better success than the Median detachment. Things went much as before, the two armies fighting in a narrow space, and the barbarians using shorter spears than the Greeks, and having no advantage from their numbers. The Lacedaemonians fought in a way worthy of note, and showed themselves far more skillful in fight than their adversaries often turning their backs and making as though they were all flying away, on which the barbarians would rush after them with much noise and shouting, when the Spartans at their approach would wheel round and face their pursuers, in this way destroying vast numbers of the enemy. Some Spartans likewise fell in these encounters, but only a very few. At last, the Persians, finding that all their efforts to gain the pass availed nothing, and that whether they attacked by divisions or in any other way it was to no purpose, withdrew to their own quarters. During these assaults, it said that Xerxes, who was watching the battle, thrice leapt from the throne on which he sat, in terror for his army. Next day the combat was renewed, but with no better success on the part of the barbarians, the Greeks were so few that the barbarians hoped to find them disabled by reason of their wounds from offering any further resistance, and so they once more attacked them. But the Greeks were drawn up in detachments according to their cities and bore the brunt of the battle in turns, all except the Phocians who had been stationed on the mountain to guard the pathway. So when the Persians found no difference between that day and the preceding, they again retired to their quarters. Now as the king was in a great strait and knew not how he should deal with the emergency, Ephialtes, the son of Eurydemus, a man of Melis, came to him and was admitted to a conference. Stirred by the hope of receiving a rich reward at the king's hands, he had come to tell him of the pathway which led across the mountain to Thermopylae by which disclosure he brought destruction on the band of Greeks who had there withstood the barbarians. This Ephialtes afterwards, from fear of the Lacedaemonians, fled into Thessaly, and during his exile, in an assembly of the Amphictyons held at Pili, a price was set upon his head by the Pelagari. When some time had gone by, he returned from exile and went to Anticyra, where he was slain by Athenides, a native of Trachis. Athenides didn't slay him for his treachery, but for another reason which I'll mention in a later part of my history. Yet still the Lacedaemonians honoured him none the less. Thus then did Ephialtes perish a long time afterwards. Besides this, there's another story told, which I don't at all believe, to wit that Onetus, the son of Phanagoras, a native of Charistus, and Corydalus, a man of Anticyra, were the persons who spoke on this matter to the king and took the Persians across the mountain. One may guess which story is true from the fact that the deputies of the Greeks, the Pelagari, who must have had the best means of ascertaining the truth, didn't offer the reward for the heads of Anetus and Corydalus, but for that of Aphialtes of Trachis, and again from the flight of Aphialtes, which we know to have been on this account. Anetus, I allow, though he was not a Malian, might have been acquainted with the path if he had lived much in that part of the country, but as Aphialtes was the person who actually led the Persians round the mountain by the pathway, I leave his name on record as that of the man who did the deed. Great was the joy of Xerxes on this occasion, and as he approved highly of the enterprise which Ephialtes undertook to accomplish, he forthwith sent upon the errant Hidanes and the Persians under him. The troops left the camp about the time of the lighting of the lamps. The pathway along which they went was first discovered by the Malians of these parts, who soon afterwards led the Thessalians by it to attack the Phocians at the time when the Phocians fortified the pass with a wall and so put themselves under covert from danger. 
and ever since the path has always been put to an ill use by the Malians. The course which it takes is the following, beginning at the Asopus, where that stream flows through the cleft in the hills, it runs along the ridge of the mountain, which is called, like the pathway over it, Anopaya, and ends at the city of Alpinus, the first Locrian town as you come from Melis, by the stone called Melampigus, and the seats of the Cacopians. Here it's as narrow as at any other point. The Persians took this path, and crossing the Asopus, continued their march through the whole of the night, having the mountains of Oita on their right hand, and on their left those of Trachis. At dawn of day they found themselves close to the summit. Now the hill was guarded, as I've already said, by a thousand Phocian men-at-arms, who were placed there to defend the pathway, and at the same time to secure their own country. They'd been given the guard of the mountain path, while the other Greeks defended the pass below, because they'd volunteered for the service, and had pledged to themselves to Leonidas to maintain the post. The ascent of the Persians became known to the Phocians in the following manner. During all the time that they were making their way up, the Greeks remained unconscious of it, inasmuch as the whole mountain was covered with groves of oak. But it happened that the air was very still, and the leaves which the Persians stirred with their feet made, as it was likely they would, a loud rustling, whereupon the Phocians jumped up and flew to seize their arms. In a moment the barbarians came in sight, and perceiving men arming themselves were greatly amazed, for they had fallen in with an enemy when they expected no opposition. Hidanes, alarmed at the sight, and fearing lest the Phocians might be Lacedaemonians, inquired of Ephialtes to what nation these troops belonged. Ephialtes told him the exact truth, whereupon he arrayed his Persians for battle. The Phocians, galled by the showers of arrows to which they were exposed, and imagining themselves the special object of the Persian attack, fled hastily to the crest of the mountain, and there made ready to meet death. But while their mistake continued, the Persians, with Ephialtes and Hidanes, not thinking it worth their while to delay on account of Phocians, passed on and descended the mountain with all possible speed. The Greeks at Thermopylae received the first warning of the destruction which the dawn would bring on them from the seer Megistius, who read their fate in the victims as he was sacrificing. After this, deserters came in and brought the news that the Persians were marching round by the hills. It was still night when these men arrived. Last of all, the scouts came running down from the heights and brought in the same accounts when the day was just beginning to break. Then the Greeks held a council to consider what they should do, and here opinions were divided. Some were strong against quitting their post, while others contended to the contrary. So when the council had broken up, part of the troops departed and went their ways homeward to their several states. Part, however, resolved to remain and to stand by Leonidas to the last. It said that Leonidas himself sent away the troops who departed because he tendered their safety, but thought it unseemly that either he or his Spartans should quit the post which they had been especially sent to guard. For my own part, I incline to think that Leonidas gave the order because he perceived the Allies to be out of heart and unwilling to encounter the danger to which his own mind was made up. He therefore commanded them to retreat, but said that he himself couldn't draw back with honor, knowing that if he stayed, glory awaited him, and that Sparta in that case would not lose her prosperity. For when the Spartans, at the very beginning of the war, sent to consult the oracle concerning it, the answer which they received from the Pythoness was that either Sparta must be overthrown by the barbarians, or one of her kings must perish. The prophecy was delivered in hexameter verse, and ran thus, O ye men who dwell in the streets of broad Lacedaemon, Either your glorious town shall be sacked by the children of Perseus, or in exchange must all through the whole Laconian country mourn for the loss of a king, descendant of great Heracles. He cannot be withstood by the courage of bulls nor of lions. Strive as they may. 
He is mighty as Jove. There is naught that shall stay him till he have got for his prey your king or your glorious city. The remembrance of this answer, I think, and the wish to secure the whole glory for the Spartans caused Leonidas to send the allies away. This is more likely than that they quarreled with him and took their departure in such unruly fashion. To me it seems no small argument in favour of this view that the seer also who accompanied the army, Megistius, the Acarnanian, said to have been of the blood of Melampus, and the same who was led by the appearance of the victims to warn the Greeks of the danger which threatened them, received orders to retire, as it is certain he did, from Leonidas, that he might escape the coming destruction. Megistius, however, though bidden to depart, refused, and stayed with the army, but he had an only son present with the expedition, whom he now sent away. So the allies, when Leonidas ordered them to retire, obeyed him and forthwith departed. Only the Thespians and the Thebans remained with the Spartans, and of these the Thebans were kept back by Leonidas as hostages, very much against their will. The Thespians, on the contrary, stayed entirely of their own accord, refusing to retreat and declaring that they wouldn't forsake Leonidas and his followers. So they abode with the Spartans, and died with them. Their leader was Demophilus, the son of Diadromes. At sunrise, Xerxes made libations, after which he waited until the time when the forum is wont to fill, and then began his advance. Ephialtes had instructed him thus, as the descent of the mountain is much quicker, and the distance much shorter than the way round the hills, and the ascent. So the barbarians under Xerxes began to draw nigh, and the Greeks under Leonidas, as they now went forth, determined to die, advanced much further than on previous days until they reached the more open portion of the pass. Hitherto they had held their station within the wall, and from this had gone forth to fight at the point where the pass was the narrowest. Now they joined battle beyond the defile, and carried slaughter among the barbarians who fell in heaps. Behind them the captains of the squadrons, armed with whips, urged their men forward with continual blows. Many were thrust into the sea, and there perished. A still greater number were trampled to death by their own soldiers. No one heeded the dying. For the Greeks, reckless of their own safety and desperate, since they knew that as the mountain had been crossed, their destruction was nigh at hand, exerted themselves with the most furious valour against the barbarians. By this time the spears of the greater number were all shivered, and with their swords they hewed down the ranks of the Persians. And here, as they strove, Leonidas fell, fighting bravely, together with many other famous Spartans, whose names I have taken care to learn on account of their great worthiness, as indeed I have those of all the three hundred. There fell, too, at the same time very many famous Persians, among them two sons of Darius, Abrochames and Hyperanthes, his children by Fratagune, the daughter of Artanes. Artanes was brother of King Darius, being a son of his Taspes, the son of Arsames, and when he gave his daughter to the king, he made him heir likewise of all his substance, for she was his only child. Thus two brothers of Xerxes here fought and fell, and now there arose a fierce struggle between the Persians and the Lacedaemonians over the body of Leonidas, in which the Greeks four times drove back the enemy, and at last, by their great bravery, succeeded in bearing off the body. This combat was scarcely ended when the Persians and Ephialtes approached, and the Greeks, informed that they drew nigh, made a change in the manner of their fighting. Drawing back into the narrowest part of the pass and retreating even behind the cross wall, they posted themselves upon a hillock, where they stood all drawn up together in one close body, except only the Thebans. The hillock whereof I speak is at the entrance of the straits, where the stone lion stands, which was set up in honour of Leonidas. Here they defended themselves to the last, such as still had swords, using them, and the others resisting with their hands and teeth, till the barbarians, who in part had pulled down the wall and attacked them in front, in part had gone round.